our sensor is sensing the motion in this particular case, what I've described so far, on the bearing itself. Now imagine if this was the shaft inside the machine. And like a lot of my animations that you'll see today, um, I exaggerate some of the motion. So there's the shaft moving around in that sort of circular motion, perhaps because of unbalance or a bent shaft. And for simplicity's sake, we've put a dial indicator on the shaft. So as the shaft moves back and forward, it pushes the plunger in and out. We see the needle move and we get this pattern. That pattern is a sine wave. It's a pure sine wave. It has a single frequency and a single amplitude. Now this isn't the way we normally measure vibration. In certain machines, and I'll talk more about that a little later, we can use these non-contact eddy current probes, also known as proximity probes, and it is literally measuring the distance between the tip and the shaft. Um, we use those in certain applications. We used to use velocity probes a lot, but now it's more common to use accelerometers. It sits on the bearing housing and senses how it is moving in response to all the things going on inside the machine. Either way, if we've only got one force, if you like, one source of vibration, we will see just one frequency and one amplitude. In reality, there are multiple sources of vibration inside the machine, which we'll talk about in just a moment, and therefore we have a more sophisticated or more complicated time waveform. But if I speed the machine up, you see the shaft is now moving, uh, it has more cycles per second or more cycles per minute and therefore our cycles on our little time waveform graph here are closer together. Uh, alternatively, let's just push the amplitude up. So if I make more movements, my time waveform is going to uh, reflect that. Now the amplitude is greater. Of course, it looks a bit silly there, but anyway, that's you see the point I'm trying to make. So that's the basic thing. This is one frequency, one signal, one frequency. It's a perfect sine wave. It has a certain frequency, and it has a certain amplitude, and that's all very important. Now, let's go to a bit of a closer real-world situation. So what I'm going to do here is I've got a green bearing uh, with a grey shaft and grey pulley and this orange uh, fan sitting here, the orange blades. So what I'm going to do is turn on the vibration that's coming from that grey shaft. Now, just to clarify something, uh, all the vibration is being measured on this bearing with our accelerometer. That's sort of what we're simulating. But what I can do, just for educational purposes, is turn on and off these three dominant sources of vibration. So, there is the vibration at the running speed at the once per revolution frequency. If I speed up the machine then like we saw just before the waves get a bit closer together. If I have more amplitude I get a bigger signal. So from this grey shaft I've got this grey vibration. That's sort of what we saw a moment ago. I'm going to turn that off and let's have a look at the green bearing now. And Lo and behold, now I've got green vibration, but it's clearly a different frequency. It's a higher frequency. Now, in reality, bearings can generate four different frequencies, and those frequencies, those signals, if you like, are not normally simple and sinusoidal. We'll talk more about that uh, soon. For now, let's just focus on the fact that we've got a different frequency because uh, the bearings as, they, as the rolling elements roll around, the interactions that occur are a different frequency from just the running speed. Um, now, if, if the bearings were in tip-top condition, very good condition, I actually don't expect to see any green vibration. But as the problem develops, I get more and more green vibration related to the bearings. Let's turn that off for a second. I've got 10 blades on this fan. And if the air flowed through those blades nice and uniformly, I might not get very much vibration. But if there wasn't as much uniformity, if the blades were bent, let's say, or a number of other potential problems, I get more vibration. But this is a different frequency from the two we've seen before. So I've got my green vibration from the bearings, 
my gray vibration just from the shaft once per revolution vibration. And because I've got 10 blades, which the way I've set this up, it's a higher frequency than the bearing frequency, uh, we can see more of a problem, less of a problem. Now, from everything that I've described, hey, you're a budding vibration analyst now. If you could see what I'm seeing there, and you see that the little gray waveform is low in amplitude, you'd be saying, oh good, the uh, machine's nicely balanced. Oops, it's not as balanced as well. Oop, the bearings are in good condition. Uh, the bearings are getting worse and worse. So you get the idea. Unfortunately, this is not exactly how it works um, because we don't see those three nicely colored uh, signals. We see the summation of all three. They add together. They combine to make the housing of that bearing move according to this red line. And that's what the sensor feels. That's what the accelerometer feels. And that's therefore the signal that goes up to our data collector. So that's what's happening. That's there. But as you can see, could you look at that red waveform and see whether it's balanced or there's a bearing problem? No, it, it's difficult. So that's why we use spectrum analysis. 